Thank you for Terrapin for inviting me. This is my first trip to this conference, and I've, I've learned a lot over the last couple of days, so we look forward to coming back uh, in the next uh, few conferences. I, I think that um, I was invited for two reasons, and let me explain. Uh, the U.S. Arab Chamber of Commerce, it's a nonprofit organization out of the U.S., established uh, about 16 years ago to facilitate business dialogue between the United States and the Arab world. We found in the U.S. that only the IOCs had access to some of the NOCs in the Middle East, and the NOCs in the Middle East had nobody back in the States to use uh, as sort of a liaison to some of the smaller companies. The Chamber has access to about 26,000 companies in the U.S., and we're very fortunate to have a, a very interactive board of directors. And our board uh, consists of either the chairman, the CEO, or the president of most of the major IOCs and many of the NOCs, ExxonMobil, ConocoPhillips, Marathon, uh, GDF Suez, and, and Shell, and uh, BG, British Gas, here in the UK. In the uh, Middle East, we have the chairman of uh, Kuwait Petroleum, Abu Dhabi National Oil, uh, QP and Ross Gas in Doha, and uh, Babco in Bahrain, and of course Aramco and Exxon Mobil were the two founding uh, members of the chamber that helped seed the organization about 16 years ago. And so we have a very interactive board. It gives me, as chairman of the board, sort of a front row seat, in a sense, to a lot of the business strategies that uh, occur inside of each of the NOCs, also the business strategies inside of the IOCs, and a very interesting perspective when they begin to interact with each other. And so um, it's sort of from that perspective that, that I think I come here to London today. And as Lawrence said, uh, I ran the utility, the gas and electric utility in New York City from 1995 to about late 2003 of course, through the 9-11 event in 2001. And this was, I've heard a lot of talk today and yesterday about shale gas in the U.S., including comments that uh, Brian made a few minutes ago. And when I ran the utility in New York City in the Northeast, our geography went from just north of Washington, D.C., all the way to Maine, including Boston Gas, Boston Electric, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, all of the northeastern seaboard. Prior to um, the discovery of shale gas, we struggled for gas. And I think there's an, an analogy to be drawn, and that's what I wanted to question the panel on today. There was an analogy back when we ran the utility in the Northeast, not having access to gas, and we were growing. And the Northeast was one of the fastest growing areas of the United States. And it was a time in the 90s when and I heard in conversations earlier today about not building in my backyard. There were no new gas pipelines to be built from the Gulf of Mexico where we produced our gas up to the northeast. It was not going to happen. Some of the lines were not yet built coming in from Canada uh, to the south. And I remember Dan Jurgen and I used to debate this all the time about what do we do? What do we do this year? What do we do next year? And it was a time to where we began, of course, Qatar was coming on. Uh, Trinidad, Tobago, other places with the LNG, and we were in heavy discussions with the LNG exporters to the U.S. about some of these long-term commitments about how we could uh, satisfy our supply commitments. Now, today, we live in a different world with shale gas, and as Brian said, I mean, we could be a net uh, exporter at some point, but I agree. I don't think that the economics are there for the U.S. This is my own personal opinion to really become a key player in the export uh, market. And so that brings us back to the Middle East. And in a lot of my discussions with the CEOs and Jamal's uh, boss, uh, Mr. Alzanki at the KPC, um, we have a real problem with the industrial explosion in the Middle East. And uh, you know they're all going to be net importers of gas. And some good, good photographs up there and maps of uh, the gas pipelines, and so this is where I wanted to focus uh, today and just ask the panel about security of supply in each of their respective uh, countries, and um, you know, and where where do you begin to balance 
um, your own internal consumption versus you know, the need to grow and how do you balance and help the governments of these countries balance that growth in industrial demand. Uh, Dubai, we all know what's happening in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Doha. Uh, it's not like it was every time I fly in there, it's, uh, it's a, it's, it has a different look to it. There's more growth. In Qatar, you know, we have the, the FIFA, the World Cup coming up uh, in uh, 2022. And it's, it's a real concern. It's the concern that I, fa I faced back in New York and before we had the shale gas and uh, always worrying about uh, the future. So I wanted to start there. I was going to start with Mehmet and ask uh, that maybe he give us the benefit of his thoughts in just an overview of the Middle East uh, situation. Yeah. Well, thank you, Daniel. Um, <coughs> thanks also for the fascinating presentations from Brian and Jamal. Uh, it's interesting that you talk about security of supply uh, in the Middle East. You know, we have become so much accustomed to the security of demand for mm -hmm. Middle Eastern producers. Uh, now they are suffering the same problem as European Union, as well as United States and China. And uh, there is a fascinating puzzle there, natural gas puzzle especially. And uh, although Middle East uh, has more than 40% of the world's natural gas reserves, and two-thirds of the world's oil reserves, and it has started to face a serious shortage in natural gas supply, and uh, especially in so it's not working. Mm -hmm. That's better, perhaps? Yes. Especially in uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, and Kuwait, and perhaps increasingly in Saudi Arabia as well. Brian mentioned Saudi Arabia burning around 700,000 barrels per day for cooling, and their total consumption uh, was around two th in 2007, 1.7 million barrels per day, domestic consumption. As of last year, I think it's about 2.5 million. And it's on the way to go. If you, if you are to believe what Chatham House says, Saudi Arabia is going to have a serious problem in terms of mm -hmm. its future production and domestic consumption. And so, uh, of course, there are new uh, gas plays coming to the picture. And uh, there is a cliche now, game changing. Everything that we hear is becoming a game changer. So I'd like to mention perhaps two game changers, if I could, uh, in the region. Uh, one is KRG, Kurdish regional government. And uh, Laurent said that uh, it's yet to come to the picture. But I can tell you that it is uh, coming to the picture already. Things have started to develop faster than we expected. Perhaps we can discuss it later on. And the next game changer is Israel and East Mediterranean with the offshore uh, Tamar field coming onshore, coming on stream around 2013, then uh, Leviathan 2017. So we'll have two additional entry to the uh, gas supply market. So perhaps you know, when time comes, I'll be happy to expand on this, uh, Daniel. Okay. Thank you, Mehmet. Let me ask uh, Jamal to comment on uh, Kuwait in particular, but please feel free to offer comments on the rest of the Gulf. But the, uh, the industrial growth, the need for internal, you know, the gas consumption in, uh, internally within Kuwait, uh, how does KPC and the KPC family of companies intend to try to meet that demand? Thank you, David. Uh, actually, uh, uh, KBC and its companies uh, has um, already uh, set uh, uh, a very challenging plan to, to try to meet uh, uh, that uh, uh, expected uh, high demand in, uh, for gas. Actually, besides uh, trying to develop the, the domestic uh, uh, gas field, of, uh, either uh, the free gas in the, in the north as well as uh, in the south. Uh, we also uh, 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 planning to uh, 
import uh, uh, LNG, actually. It, um, uh, the LNG project was uh, intended in the beginning to uh, be on, on all, uh, only medium uh, term for uh, like five years, starting from year 2009. And uh, now we have discovered that um, after uh, trying uh, the, the, the gas import, we discover that you no, know, the demand uh, will probably continue. Uh, the growth of, of demand is much faster than uh, than uh, the, the the supply uh, uh, developed in uh, in land, uh, and uh, we will continue uh, probably um, importing uh, uh, for. Uh, for at least uh, until the tw uh, 2025. Uh, currently, we are um, uh, also uh, develop uh, developing a study uh, to assess our situation with regard to developing uh, an import uh, terminal, a permanent import terminal, not like the one that we are using now, which is uh, a floating one. This would uh, enable us to uh, import uh, all uh, year long, uh, as well as having uh, a storage to uh, optimize on the, the, let's say, the surplus sometime during uh, winter. Because as you may know, our demand is very highly seasonal. Uh, so uh, most of the demand comes uh, in the summer because of the high uh, temperature. Uh, so the, the gas import, development of gas uh, fields, uh, also uh, uh, trying to also to have uh, an alternative liquid fuel uh, available for, for our uh, power stations. Even lately now, uh, KBC with some of the government uh, entities are trying also to uh, try to introduce alternative uh, energy uh, concept uh, to, to the picture, the overall picture. Good, thank you. Uh, Brian, I'd like to ask the same question that uh, Jamal uh, was asked and then what he just ended with. How does Oman plan to uh, make up the need you know, for, for gas uh, given its growth internally, but then also are, is Oman looking at alternative energies alternative sources of fuel? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the supply side in Oman is, is critical at the moment. It's on balance, yeah. Um, that is not to say that Oman doesn't have more gas. So the, the, the most promising uh, next production will probably come from tight gas, which is gas usually down the, the four or five kilometers deep. Um, and there are figures quoted by the developer of that tight gas, which is uh, BP, and they're talking about anything up to 100 TCF. Now, even if a reasonable percentage of that I I is producible, uh, then it is significant. Um, the real question, though, is at what price? Yeah? The timing will be, I believe, around 2016-17 when that will come on stream in significant quantities. And that will be, for Oman, uh, certainly a, a huge relief and, and it certainly would be sufficient to meet the uh, demand forecasts and possibly even leave some gas uh, over for at least consideration for, for, for further exports uh, expansion. Um, the challenge to expand its portfolio or its energy portfolio um, there was uh, one proposal some years ago to actually install a, a cold powered fire station in Dukum, which is another area, development area, industrial development area in the country. That met with some very serious opposition uh, because of the, the impact it would have on the carbon footprint of the country. Uh, and that was shelved for, for, for those reasons. Um, the upstream where the demand for energy for oil recovery is increasing and increasing dramatically, they are looking at alternative uh, possibilities. One is, for example, solar power uh, for, in, for, for, for steam. And uh, there is a pilot project uh, at this moment in time in that area. If it proves successful, it could be significant and it could help to release ga gas that otherwise would be used for, for um, oil recovery. Um, 
I, th I believe there's also looking in the neighborhood. I mean, say there's um, the distance from Oman at the, at the northern peak to Iran, for example. It's, it's only a, a, a stone's throw away. Um, Iran has more than sufficient gas. Iran is ready to export, provided the, 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 uh, its position in the world can be changed. Uh, or vice versa, maybe the world will change and uh, Iran doesn't change, who knows. But whichever way it goes, you know, the, the, the ability to actually to, uh, to sell its um, gas in, on the international uh, markets uh, is certainly attractive. I think as I speak, uh, there has been now eight or is it nine MOUs signed to try to realize that between Oman and Iran. It, they have come to nothing yet. Um, I believe one of the big stumbling blocks, though, is something that uh, Jamal just mentioned, and, and that is when you have a Kuwait, a Bahrain, a Dubai importing gas as LNG, guess what is setting the price in the, in the region? And that price is compared against an alternative of, of the Asia Pacific. So it is at prices which are almost 10 times what the price that governments are asking of their domestic and industrial um, citizens. And it just doesn't equate. And so, so, so there's a real dilemma, you know, that indeed, when you have a Bahrain, which is, as the bird flies, 40 kilometers from Qatar. 40 kilometers. Now tell me about the economics of LNG at 40 kilometers distance. It just doesn't equate. If I go to Kuwait, forgive me, Jamal, at a few hundred kilometers from Qatar, and tell me about the economics of LNG. It just doesn't equate. Now, turning it upside down, the opportunities for you know, optimizing the utilization of the gas, which the region is so blessed with, are tremendous. It just doesn't have the network. Now, and there are many reasons for that, and if you wish to go into it, we can, we can talk about it, but the, 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 there is a need for a political will, as well as for the private sector making the business case for interconnectivity. Um, and I, you know, it's still maybe some years away. It may be the next decade before we get there. But it's such an opportunity. And if it's not taken, then the scenarios, the almost doomsday scenario, whether it's uh, Chatham House or whatever else, will become closer to reality. Great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, just one last question from me, and then we'll get questions from the audience. I don't think any conversation about the Middle East and the energy uh, sector would be complete without at least bringing up the Arab Spring. Um, we've all watched the Arab Spring unfold over the last year, and my question beginning with Mamat would be, what are your thoughts on that uh, related to the, you know, the geosensitivities of the various countries in the Gulf doing business with each other? Uh, Brian mentioned the pipeline that uh, from Qatar through UAE now down into Oman. That was once a net exporter, now it's an importer. And then you go and you develop your industries around this, and then all of a sudden there's an event. And who knows what the event is? And then what do you do then? And so just your thoughts on the Arab Spring and the current state of sensitivities sort of in the Gulf region. Yes. Well, I think geopolitics are back. And we have to reckon with the geopolitics. In the past, it was quite difficult to sell geopolitics to big corporations. As, uh, you know, we were operating on the basis of commercial realities and pushing through promotion and incentives, whatever you have. But today, especially Arab, after the Arab Spring, uh, it has become an essential part of any equation mm -hmm. that companies have to take into account. Also look at egypt israeli relationship. And the pipeline between, an Egypt, between Egypt and Israel, uh, I think, uh, bombed about 17 times in a year. Mm -hmm. And then canceled altogether. And thanks God uh, for Israelis, perhaps. And uh, the Tamar field will be on stream from 2013. So Israel will become self-sufficient in natural gas for today's current consumption, as well as for future projected uh, demand. And with Leviathan, perhaps they will become a significant uh, exporter of gas from 2017 onwards. And uh, look at Turkey-KRG relationship. Because of the PKK issue, 
and also fear in Turkey that there will be a Kurdistan created, destabilizing the region. And uh, so about six, seven months ago, it was even unthinkable that Turks and Kurds will come together and make a deal on oil and uh, gas uh, trading, cross-border trade. Now it's a reality. Both sides at the highest level, political level, came together. And uh, it is not going to take long time before they open the borders for direct, without going through Baghdad, for direct cross-border trading between Kurdish regional government and Turkey. And East Mediterranean, there the disputes between Turkey and Israel, relations deteriorated as a result of uh, flotilla incidents over the past two, three years, and quite antagonistic right now, might change later. <coughs> and also Turkey's strong opposition to Cyprus exploring its own uh, economic, exclusive economic zone. And uh, also blacklisting all the companies wishing to explore in that area and uh, sending emissaries to all the capitals saying that please control your company somehow, otherwise we won't allow you to operate in Turkey. So using political muscles, also the risk that it could escalate into military conflict, sending naval uh, forces to escort their seismic ships and all others. So it looks that uh, geopolitics and also using military muscles are becoming uh, somehow uh, coming to the picture again, which we haven't seen before. Therefore, it's very important that uh, both producing, consuming, and transit countries should be engaged in comprehensive dialogue to create win-win propositions in the region. But one concern I have uh, above uh, all, you know, yes, geopolitical risks are there, uh, but also investment risk. I mean, who is going to invest all these billions of dollars? IEA says about $250 billion needed in the short term in the uh, natural gas production and infrastructure. In this financially distressed era, and plus low cost gas, $2, $3 in US, and how would investors be encouraged or incentivized to put more money into that? In addition to that, you have, of course, political risks, then the other issue which Arab Spring brings to the fore is subsidies. Unless you have rational pricing in these countries, the consumption will continue to grow because it's cheap gas, cheap oil. And this is a vicious cycle. But on the other hand, you need to ensure that there is political and social stability in these countries. How could you remove subsidies? You have to do it gradually, phase them out. And therefore, I think the challenges are uh, multiple in the region. It's not going to go away uh, quickly. And Aie was talking about golden age for natural gas. Probably it's the golden age for consumers, for consuming countries. Uh, because in Turkey, I can tell you from my own experience that we are paying the highest gas price to Gazprom than Iran. And uh, now Azerbaijan, relatively cheaper, offering brotherly uh, prices to Turkey, and KRG gas, if it happens, will be cheapest <coughs> you can get, because in order uh, to ensure that there is a gas-to-gas -gas competition mm. and to open the border for trading from gas trading from KRG, I think they have to offer better prices. So we are witnessing quite interesting transformations in this area. Very good. Jamal, any comments? Any comments on the yes, sure. Arab Spring sensitivities? No, no, I fully agree with Mohammed. I mean, actually, uh, probably uh, collaboration and integration is, is, is the key word here. I mean, collaboration on, um, on, the, on, on, on um, producing some win-win situation for, uh, for uh, let's say, a producer and a consumer country in the region. Uh, by means of uh, pipeline uh, supplies uh, uh, from from suppliers uh, like Qatar to to uh, uh, consumers like Kuwait, Bahrain, or or, um, or others, uh, and also integration of of their policies. I mean, I fully agree with Mohammed on on the subsidies. Actually, even uh, one single country in the region cannot. 
uh, go on uh, on its own uh, regarding uh, b b setting or resetting the, their uh, pricing uh, policies. They have to do it uh, jointly. Uh, actually, um, an example for, for Kuwait. Uh, Gas locally is sold uh, for, for less than a dollar per uh, billion BTU. Even, uh, I, I'll give you a, a, even a more <laughs> worse example than that, electricity uh, cost or, or, or price in the, the local market does not exceed 7% of its, uh, of its uh, <laughs> Uh, does not exceed more than 7% of its uh, actual cost. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how uh, people will really uh, not feel responsible or, or, uh, or will not feel the cost. I mean, um, you still... Uh, uh, but this cannot be done in isolation of, of uh, agreement between all uh, the others. Uh, probably this is what I, uh, I can say. I mean, uh, the issue is becoming more uh, now important and hot, and as you can see, uh, many also shared uh, fields among uh, the countries, which requires really a very uh, good coordination and uh, collaboration. Brian? Well, I suppose maybe before the Arab Spring, uh, when somebody asked me about the stakeholders in Oman LNG, I would just put up my hand and say there's five of them. There's, there's the buyers, the shareholders, government employees, and communities. And I would rattle that off and talk about the engagement with the, each of those fives. Uh, it's now hundreds of thousands because social media has introduced a whole new dimension of engagement, uh, which we still haven't quite got used to coping with. Um, if I was to ask about the, the, the Arab Spring, um, uh, and uh, the, it was a quote, I think actually was, I heard Tony Blair, maybe I should say that in soft voice here, but he, he made a comment which I thought was very useful. He said, it's not important how a revolution starts, it is more important how it finishes. And so in a way what you've seen is the start of a revolution, or maybe some people think it's evolution, but whichever you, you think, it's, it's where's the end game, where are people, where's the vision to where it's going to? And I believe those countries who have engaged uh, more effectively with their populations are, are seeing more success. And I like to think Oman is one of those countries. Those who have been less effective engaging with their population, in some cases they've had disastrous consequences, uh, and in, in others they've just putting off the, that day of engagement that, which must come, yeah? And does point to some potential instabilities in the region that still exist, and some very serious ones. Um, so coming back to the the Arab Spring, yes, it, it's um, had a multiple of effects. It, it has raised expectations. Uh, one of the problems in the Gulf, of course, is that the distribution of wealth is, is not balanced. Yeah? So you've got a Qatar, for example, with the uh, GDP per capita of nearly $180,000. I mean, that's huge. Yeah, I, mean, say, I don't know what you do with that amount of money yeah, per capita. You've got the UAE, where the average per capita is seventy-five to 80000 it's more than Switzerland, yeah? And then you've got countries like Oman and Saudi Arabia at 25, 26,000 per capita. A more respectable number, you would say. But you know and I know that the distribution of that ain't quite 25,000 per capita. And it is a real issue. And, and the, 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 the mechanism of um, doling it out through subsidies is actually killing entrepreneurship. The mechanism of, of, of um, providing people with the fish and not the fishing rod is killing entrepreneurship. One of the biggest challenges in the region, and, and one which the IOCs, and, and I'm sure, David, you've been involved in too, how do you actually create in-country, in-regional value? Yeah, it is many, this is, it, this is a, a challenge for many of the big players in the oil and gas sector. So how do you create value within the countries in which you operate? It is relatively easy, I'm not saying it's that easy, but it's relatively easy to do how you envisage that in, in, in South America or in Africa even, yeah? given all its challenges. But in the Middle East, when you don't have what I call is the real hunger, it is consequently more difficult. 
And, and so how you, you, you actually get to that position to really build on not only um, economic growth, which is relatively easy if you keep investing more dollars in petrochemicals, refineries, in uh, energy intensive industries. But how do you provide diversification in economies that are so highly dependent on hydrocarbons? Very difficult. In Oman, for example, and I, I tread carefully on this, but you know, the, the vision has been for the last nearly 20 years of growth and diversification. And there's been many good attempts the growth is there, but the diversification is not. And the dependency on the, the molecule of hydrocarbon, whether it's liquid or gas, hasn't changed in the last 20 years. And it is difficult to see how you get out of that and how you actually create that real diversification. And this is not just a challenge for Oman, it is a challenge for any uh, resource-rich country, by the way. Yeah? Mm -hmm. How do you actually get that real diversification? Um, uh, I wish I had the answer. Could I just say a few words about its diversification, which is at the heart of many uh, governments' agenda in the region, and not only in Middle East and Gulf, but also if you go to Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and elsewhere, Latin America, they are all trying to promote this. As you mentioned in your presentation yesterday, I mean, our industry is very capital intensive. It's not creating many jobs. Therefore, most of the NOCs are putting pressure on IOCs to find ways of creating new jobs. How you do this? Getting into downstream petrochemicals and, uh, or local content requirements. This creates a huge challenge for IOCs because on the one hand, you have to comply with the world-class standards and also deliver your projects within the time frame. And on the other hand, you have to comply with the request of the host government which ask you to use more labor, to use more local uh, equipment, engineering. And so that will not be resolved, especially with the Arab Spring. Now there will be more demand on IOCs to create more jobs and to, to give more opportunities, contracts to local suppliers and uh, businesses. And also investment climate will not get better in my view. We are already seeing signs of that. Quote, unquote, resource nationalism will be on the increase. It's already happening in Russia, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, elsewhere, Venezuela, we see that. And in the Middle East and North Africa, I think we'll see more signs of resource nationalism. And this will, be, this will mean that there will be more restrictive practices. And of course, it's good to have a greater democracy, liberalization, but also uh, this will bring up some demands which will be difficult for the governments to uh, undertake and deliver, then they will try to shift the responsibility to uh, IOCs somehow. So that's a challenge at a time when these regions require massive amounts of investment. So how you will get private investment channeled to these areas? Very good. Think? Thank you. Thank you to the panel. Terence, do we have Time for one question or no? One question. Any one question from the audience? This gentleman. I mean, I, I guess what's interesting is if, if we're agreed that, that these subsidies are one of the biggest challenges that makes sort of the Middle East uh, very complex, how much of the consumption is actually fictitious? I mean, on the one hand, we're talking about population growth driving consumption of gas, but clearly if there's inefficient use of gas and if those subsidies over time will drop inevitably given the disparity between what gas is being subsidized at versus what is it's being imported in at, it's inevitable that those subsidies will disappear. We can debate on the rate, but if that happens, then that consumption should in theory drop as well. So it's I wonder if anyone has actually looked at that or if it's even something that can be quantified in some way to basically say, you know, uh, this percentage of the consumption is actually not real. It's, it's not real under a market-driven scenario. Sounds like a mathematician question, Brian. <laughs> Well, I, I suppose, when you look at cheap energy, what does it mean? Uh, people drive bigger cars. 
uh, they don't uh, insulate their, their buildings. They don't use double glazing, yeah? Um, they don't switch off when they leave the home, you know? They, they go on holidays and turn the air cold down so it'll be nice and cool when you come back, yeah? Um, this is the behavior of, of you know, a, a subsidized economy where the, you know, the, the power is relatively va valueless, yeah? Um, the percentage, and this is, I don't know if this is mathematics or just a thumb in the air thing, but uh, uh, anything up to 40% is therefore potentially savable if you're going to start applying sensible uh, regulation in terms of building uh, regulations, uh, in terms of um, uh, taxation in one form or another on the big car. You know? I mean, the, the average uh, size of a car engine in a man is, is above three liters, yeah? So tell me about the average one in Europe, yeah? It ain't any close to it, yeah? it's, it's half that, yeah? So there's, there's lots of things you can do to encourage um, efficiency. Um, but it does, change, it does require a change in attitude. It does face governments with a dilemma where they have been using subsidies and other mechanisms uh, to meet the expectations of their populations. Yeah? Um, and to wean them off that is going to be extremely painful. Uh, and of course, you know, the first thing that happens, it'll drive inflation. So costs will go through. And then you, you, know, you get that cycle of, of needing more salaries and more wages. I mean, and already in the Middle East region, I mean, uh, I need to be careful about the numbers, but the break even uh, price per barrel needed for many of the countries, and don't quote me in which country I'm talking about, is well above 50 and close to s above 70 in some cases. So, you know, think of that number compared to just a few years ago when, you know, the budgets were based on, the, you know, uh, one third of that number. So the cost structure in the region has escalated uh, potentially to a very dangerously high number. So something's going to have to give. Um, but I'm the optimist. I mean, I think this is an opportunity. This is, I mean, we can get all depressed about this. Yeah? It doesn't, doesn't solve anything, yeah? I tell my kids, worries don't get you through your exams. A bit of hard work does, yeah? And, and, and so there's a huge opportunity here. But it, it's a tough one. And it does have a political dimension, which will be a very delicate one to, to, to steer through, yeah? Because the expectations of populations are, you know, not where they should be, yeah? Well, I think it's quite difficult to do away uh, with uh, subsidies. And even in a relatively more advanced country like Turkey, still, for the past 10 years, we've been talking about liberalization of natural gas markets, heavy subsidies still provided. And, but one way of perhaps uh, reducing the uh, downside of subsidies is First, as you said, perhaps to improve energy efficiency, more than 40%. So much waste of energy in these countries. So you can rationalize the structures. The other way which Egypt started to apply is uh, to introduce targeted subsidies rather than across the board to all segments of the society and industries. Now Egypt, I think, increased the energy prices about 60, 70% for energy intensive industries. So through uh, somehow um, differentiated pricing, you could start doing it. So addressing only the most uh, negatively affected segments of the society for political reasons, you have to protect them. So you can continue providing subsidies for them. I don't think that this is going to disappear anytime soon, but perhaps applying uh, more rational pricing to wealthier parts of the population as well as the industries using intensive energy. Just one uh, more uh, point. Actually, uh, subsidy would, would, would really matter uh, if, if you are lifting uh, subsidy. Uh, in, in a case like, for example, uh, not only Kuwait, even, even the, the, you know, the, the other Arabian Gulf uh, countries, uh, you would find that there is uh, uh, a big, uh, let's say, uh, uh, group of companies will 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 try to be competitive, uh, utilizing the subsidized 
fuel and 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 uh, and, and power uh, cost. Uh, actually, uh, just imagine. I mean, you will uh, you are a manufacturer there in in, in the Gulf. You will get almost free of charge uh, fuel and and power. So of course you will be competitive, and uh, most of your profitability would come from the subsidized fuel and uh, and uh, and feed. Sometimes even feed. So mm -hmm. it, it's uh, it, it's very normal. I mean, if you uh, make it like market related more, it will reduce uh, uh, it will reduce consumption.